Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast. Best practices for eliminating SSL encrypted traffic blind spots. My name is Trevor and I will be moderating this webcast. Today's featured speakers are John Pescatori, Director of Emerging Security Trends, Greg Mayfield, Director of Product Marketing at Bluecoat Systems, and David Wells, VP of Product Management at Bluecoat. Before I turn things over to them, the Q&A portion will take place at the end of the webcast. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the questions window. Right now, I'd like to turn things over to John. Okay, thanks Trevor, and welcome everyone. I'm John Pescatori. I came to SANS about two years ago after many years at Gartner. And this topic, best practices for eliminating encrypted traffic blind spots, is, is very key to security, both in detecting attacks on their way in, uh, also on detecting successful attacks, sending data out, and a whole bunch of other areas. So that's what we're going to drill down on here for the next 45 minutes or so. Here's sort of a rough overall time frame of what we'll do. I'll, I'll give about a 50,000 foot flyby of the threat issue and some of the key issues in thinking through how to do a better job of detecting attacks that are using advanced evasion techniques, including SSL. Then I'll turn it over to Greg and David from Blue Coat, who will drill down some more and then give you a demo of some capabilities. And we're going to save the last 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, so uh, to reinforce what Trevor said, over there on the right-hand side, you see that questions box. As we're going along, just enter them in. Some we may be able to get to as we go, but uh, at the end, we'll get to all of them. And if we don't, at the very end, I'll give you some URLs. You can get answers later on. So with that, let's get started. So the bottom line is uh, 2014 certainly pointed out that for many enterprises, the advanced targeted threats out there have gotten ahead of their mainstream defenses. Um, and what's really key are two elements of, of advances the threats made last year and, and over recent years. By far the biggest one is the advanced level of targeting. These are not just malware being sprayed out to see where it sticks. These are carefully researched attacks that are looking to compromise specific companies for specific types of information and are looking to get in and stay in and continue to uh, exfiltrate information, continue to compromise more machines. And the fact that they are very targeted, they may only use, be used against one company or one industry, uh, they may be using a common exploit kit, but often that's tailored enough to evade simple signature-based defenses. So that breaks a lot of the uh, ways we do intrusion detection and other things. Equally important, they're increasingly using very advanced evasion techniques, well, whether it's fragmented packet type things to get around intrusion detection or increasingly the use of encryption, um, encrypting both the payload to prevent inspection and make it harder for advanced uh, threat detection techniques, the, the FireEyes and others of the world, to execute them, and also increase use of SSL for communications to blind network-based detection type systems, um, or to snuggle up with increasing use of legitimate applications that more and more are turning on SSL, and I'll go through a couple statistics there. So the bottom line is, as we try to make progress in preventing more of these attacks and the ones we can't prevent, detecting them faster and, and resolving them sooner, basically trying to minimize damage to the enterprise, dealing with these evasion techniques is a very key part of succeeding in that uh, to those goals. Now, there's areas where the, the attacks really haven't changed. I mean, they're still going after weaknesses and vulnerabilities in two key areas. Our people, you know, so phishing attacks that are often the first wave of every attack, trying to get uh, credentials or trying to steer people to compromise websites and, and phishing hole or drive-by type attacks. Where we did see the growth area in the uh, threat vectors the past couple years were the attackers going after third-party connections. Certainly Target was an example of that where an HVAC contractor was targeted and compromised. Um, but increasingly they're going after our suppliers and other things that connect to us if they found that we were pretty well protected, they'll go find the weak point and somebody connected to us. And quite often, we have SSL connections out to our third-party suppliers, um, making it often more difficult to inspect traffic going to and from those locations. And too often, we treat third-party as part of the trusted network when they're clearly not. Another huge growth area is attacks against the basic infrastructure. You know, last, last year, the Heartbleed attack going after uh, open SSL type components, this year's ghost vulnerability in Linux, um, and, and other things, whether it's Cisco routers or internet protocols, you know, quite often the attacks are now saying that let's look into the fundamental infrastructure or products or DNS 
things that are used in Internet commerce, and let's attack those. Um, those can be very difficult to attack when your infrastructure, or to detect when your infrastructure is compromised, and uh, it's another thing to keep in mind. Probably the biggest growth in the past year was those, the use of those evasion techniques. The targetings of trend been happening for a couple of years. The rapid growth in use of evasion techniques was something a number of studies pointed out last year. I always like to look at Microsoft's security intelligence report. It comes out twice a year. We should be seeing the one that will cover the last half of 2014. The latest one I found was the uh, one covering the first half of 2014. And you can see in this uh, chart in the upper left where they show the uh, different types of exploits encountered. And by encountered, this is Microsoft saying that it was seen uh, active on Windows PCs around the world as part of their uh, statistics they gather on just about every PC that runs Windows Update and the uh, Microsoft uh, malicious software threat removal tool. You can see, if you look down at the bottom, you see a lot of popular things like Adobe Flash. You know, eh, The attacks are kind of flat against Adobe, even though we seem to be patching Adobe twice a week. And browser attacks, operating system attacks. Well, you see the real growth were in those exploit kits and other HTML and JavaScript type exploits. Uh, and, and, the whoops, and growth was in using SSL. Um, Whoever is clicking on the screen, please don't click on the screen. Um, let me go back to a bit. So on the right-hand side, um, there's also been huge growth in legitimate applications using SSL. Palo Alto is one of the leading next-generation firewalls. And uh, you can see their statistics on the percentage of applications who found this happened just happened to be Asia Pack in using SSL. Uh, you know, if you think about the Googles and Yahoos and Twitters and just about everybody else out there starting to turn on SSL by default, you know there's a huge growth in uh, your own users running SSL going out to the Internet. Not that they choose to do so, but the site they go to are using it. And then, of course, just about every Salesforce automation and, and other internal utility is starting to use SSL to secure communications between servers and so on, which are all good things from a security perspective. The more transport encryption we can do, um, the better we'll be at fighting uh, sniffing type attacks and eavesdropping type attacks, uh, but it does change, make more difficult the job of doing continuous monitoring on our network, which is key to, very key to keep in mind. And this points out the problem. 71% um, of victims didn't detect the breaches themselves. They came in and, and evaded existing techniques. And 85% of point of sale intrusions, this is uh, specific to retail, took weeks, and the average is really months, to be detected. Once they were discovered, when they went back and did the incident response, found out they'd been compromised for months. In many cases, much longer than that, but on average in, in months. So it's very key. Stuff is going to get in, um, but we have to more quickly be able to detect once it goes active, and certainly very quick to detect once uh, the targets, uh, the, the, the data is being exfil exfiltrated or the successful payload that got in is talking to the outside world. So when you look at a typical breach chain, this happens to be one new century put together a couple years ago that I like that's based on a very common targeting approach. Go after a specific company, target the chief financial officer, find out who his admin aide is, do some research on her, find out she's a runner, send her phishing attacks, and get something on her PC, capture the CFO's credentials, and, and then you get to the right-hand side of data extraction there. 46 days later. So we had 46 days that essentially the, the bad guys are active against us here. And in this case, they detected this several weeks after day 46. Um, so really almost two months before they detected what was going on. And all along the way, there were several opportunities um, to disrupt this. Uh, in, in the very front end, if we were monitoring some external websites and the like, we probably would have seen connections from either totally unknown brand new URLs or URLs that were on bad reputation lists and got an idea that, hey, perhaps somebody is doing some reconnaissance against us. Once that payload, uh, the first attack came where the, the machine was compromised or went out to the compromised website and downloaded the exploit kit, um, advanced threat detection type systems, if they could have inspected the payload, if it was over an unencrypted connection or if the encryption could have been broken, uh, many cases we would have detected the payload on the way in. Uh, once other machines started to be compromised and we detected unusual communications between uh, the compromised admin aids machine and the servers on the financial database and the like, if we could have monitored that traffic, we would have known something was up much more quickly 
And of course, finally, during the ex exfiltration phase, when the financial information or the entire database was being sent out, uh, certainly there's ways of looking at traffic anomalies. We can look at things, uh, have known something was wrong, but certainly things like data loss prevention or other content aware tools, if they could have inspected the traffic, which was probably encrypted on the way out, then we would have been aware that very sensitive information was flying out the door. So this is very key. There's a whole bunch of different ways, a lot of different tools and security controls we can apply across the breach chain um, to disrupt it earlier and earlier and limit the damage. Um, and it's here at SANS, it's uh, very key. I'll, I'll talk through the critical controls in a, sec in a second, that the, those are the controls we use. But it's very key that we think about ways of having some metrics, some ways we can show measurable increases in security. It's very easy to point to news items about the latest breach happening, but when we go ask for the money to buy a solution, um, we need to be able to show, you know, here's what happened to us next year, here's the attacks we could have avoided, here's the increase in our security posture or security uh, metrics that we think we can get if we improve. And here's a simple set of metrics I found over uh, my years in, in security to be very successful. Um, at the top are some simple questions we want to be able to answer. Of the known threats that are out there, known attacks running, what percent am I vulnerable to? When did I last check? How do I know I'm not vulnerable right now? And when did I last update those lists of attacks? What that's basically saying is we're monitoring threat intelligence. We know what attacks are out there and we're continually assessing our own vulnerability, and we know where we have vulnerabilities that match up to those attacks. And then there's some time and quantity metrics to watch. And if you look on the times on the quantity side, uh, those are less exciting ones. That, that, the quantity data is easy to get to. How many attacks hit us at the top? How many attacks got through our first layer? We never blocked them. How many did we detect? How many actions, uh, incident response efforts, cleanup actions, and so on um, did we have to take? The more valuable metrics are on the left, the time type metrics. Um, if you think about an attack that got through our, our first level of defenses, bypassed intrusion detection or whatever, at T0, it went active on the inside of our network. And we just said quite often the average is in months before we get to T1, before we attack the, the uh, or, or detect the attack that it's active. And then obviously T3 is when we shut it all down. Uh, decreasing those time slides, decreasing the threat time to live is really very key. It always has been when you think about it. You can go back to the days of viruses and we knew they were going to get through. The key was how quickly did we react, how quickly did we limit the damage. And that's even more important in today's world of these advanced targeted threats that aren't just crashing machines but stealing very valuable information and causing huge business damage in the hundreds of millions of dollars per incident. So that's the the measurable things to have in mind. We have no shortage of security controls and processes we can throw at the problem. Uh, SANS is a big proponent of the critical security controls as a very good way to think about and prioritize the actions you take and the investments you make to focus on the types of security actions that penetration testers and others say are the things that slow them down or really do keep the bad guys out. We won't spend much time here. We'll give you some resources URL at the end if you're not familiar with the critical controls, how you can drill down uh, to learn about them. But if you look at many of the elements on here, whether it's malware defense, data protection, um, or e uh, uh, boundary defense and the like, all these require the ability to see into the threat. And again, SSL, the use of encryption by attackers has proven to be a, a big uh, blind spot. Okay. One last point I'll leave you with. It's, it's one thing to think about throwing a lot of security controls at the problem. The critical controls gives you a way to prioritize that and think about uh, what the things you could, should do first. We also have to think about how all these things play together and how we get to more continuous security processes. Again, the more quickly we can go from knowing our baseline, what systems are out there, what the vulnerability status of everything is, understanding the risks, shielding what we can shield, uh, mitigating the problems that we can fix, and then getting around to eliminate root cause and, and starting again. If we can get that down from a once a year process to a quarterly process to a weekly process, then we can start shrinking the time to live of those threats, start changing those statistics from it taking months before we take action against an active threat um, to days if not hours. The whole goal is to change that one number, if you noticed earlier, 71% of enterprises were notified by an external party that they'd been compromised. And the two most common external parties notifying us are our customers 
and law enforcement, FBI, DHS. Oh, that's not good when our customers are the ones telling us we've screwed up their credit records. So very key to be able to move around this circle more quickly. And uh, very key to that is being able to detect the threats more quickly and more accurately. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg Mayfield from uh, Blue Code, and, and they'll do some drill down in a demo. Over to you, Greg. And remember to come off mute. Oh, Greg, have you? You might have multiple levels of mute on. Check your your local mute and your uh, your webinar mute. Can you hear me now? Uh, your your audio is very low, but you're getting there. Okay. Um, there you go. Uh, is let me try this. Now you're good. Okay. Great. So apologize for the uh, minor delay here. I was on double secret mute. And uh, let me continue on with the conversation that John was having regarding uh, managing encrypted traffic. And if you look at the statistics today, you know, and, and this is, should be no surprise to you that um, SSL TLS traffic is actually exploding. And if you look at the statistics, it's about a third of most network environments, most enterprises today. And depending on the vertical, that can change. In some cases, say for very, high, uh, very highly regulated industries, uh, healthcare, financials, government, you find that the encrypted traffic can you know, be three-fourths of that, 75 or 80 percent, if not more. So the fundamental point, though, is that it's growing. And a lot of customers and partners and, and uh, business associates ask why. Well, you just find out that there's more and more cloud applications out there, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, Salesforce, they're the, the social and uh, media, social media type of applications, and even mobile applications that are really driving this. And as you know, the benefit of SSL and PLS communications is that it provides that the data confidentiality, excuse me, data privacy. And the benefit, of course, is that you have these secure communications. That's a wonderful thing. And you have more and more protocols even taking advantage of that today. It's not just HTTPS. You find out because of these new applications in cloud and internet and mobile, uh, there's more protocols being used for communications on, on top of SSL. You have Speedy, FTP for file transfer. You have email, peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. Uh, the list goes on. So it's not just web traffic running on port 443. Uh, it's more than that. And I think if you recall, looking at the slides John just showed um, from the various vendors out there and their, their analysis and reports, that was certainly confirmed there, is that if you're thinking of SSL, please do not just think of SSL based uh, on uh, the web traffic, HTTPS. It's more than that. So when you think about, obviously, the, the courses that a lot of malware, as we've talked about, are hiding that. So increasingly more so, the advanced persistent threats are operating over SSL. So if the majority of your traffic, uh, your malware threats are actually hiding with an SSL, you certainly need some way to manage that traffic, inspect it, and actually control it appropriately through policies and rule sets and so forth. You know, the fundamental point, I think, for all of us is staying out of the news. If you look at what happened in the past year and 18 months, for the financial services industry, there were a lot of Trojans and malware that attacked banks worldwide. So you had various threats like Shylock, and you had Game Over, for example. You also had, of course, the threats on retail industry. Everyone can recall here, you know, Target and Michael stores and Home Depot and so forth. Unfortunately, those types of threats are driving, uh, are increasing as well. And what's driving it, of course, is that you have these very advanced threats. Game Over, Zeus, Shylock, SpyEye, and more that in many cases take advantage of SSL and the uh, hidden communications that it provides. So the fundamental goal, of course, for uh, any organizations is to reduce the risk, reduce their costs, and mitigate and, and minimize those data breaches. 
And interesting statistics here from Gartner is that their estimate is by uh, 2017, over half of all attacks will sell. It's not quite there yet, but it's increasing rapidly. And you find out that uh, a plan or a strategy is certainly needed by every organization to consider how to manage SSL and then how to affect their end. And to the point of a lot of folks saying, well, I already have tools in my environment. And they should see SSL or they can see SSL. And if you remember the diagram that John Pescatore just had up, uh, in the upper right, he was talking about how you can actually do the monitoring and the vulnerability assessment and so forth. The tools that we're talking about belong in that area. Basically, they have to be one of the first entry points, if you will, into your network or to a zone within your network at the perimeter. So you can then let your other existing tools process that appropriately. Right now, if you look at this model that most organizations have, everyone's following a layered defense or a uh, you know, defense in depth sub uh, type of security posture. You have your firewalls, IDS, IPS, antivirus, anti-malware now, uh, DLP. Unfortunately, most of those solutions are blind to SSL uh, in the fact that they either don't recognize it at all, but if they do recognize it, they have limited scope. They tend to only see HTTPS traffic or port 443, and they're blind to the other type of services and applications that can run on top of SSL. And as I mentioned earlier, you find out more and more of these cloud apps, mobile apps, and so forth are using non-standard ports. So the capability and to see into all of SSL is certainly imperative for uh, the security posture of any organization. And as I mentioned before, you know, if you talk about the malware examples that are out there um, that can use SSL, you have Zeus, or Shylock, and SpyEye. And if you're not familiar with these, I'd encourage you to become familiar with them because these are the types of uh, APTs and their variants that are used to wreak havoc in organizations worldwide. Another interesting data point, I'm not sure if all of you are aware of this, but just last in December, the US CERT, the uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, issued a uh, statement saying that SSL inspection of both inbound and outbound traffic is uh, one of the new mandatory type of mitigation efforts to stop advanced malware. So it's just repeating what we're stating here, but based upon the increasing number of threats and attacks that are happening, uh, certs are being um, released specifically to promote the fact that managing SSL, inspecting it appropriately is something necessary as part of any security posture within an organization. So uh, just for curiosity, those of you can check out the us.cert site and you'll find that information. I mentioned just a moment ago that you know, if some of these solutions can see SSL, they're limited. And if you look at some of the statistics here, it's pretty interesting is that you know, less than 20% of organizations with a firewall or an IPS uh, appliance actually turn on the SSL feature within their device. Um, the reason is, is that it's very processor intensive. It's rarely enabled because it slows down the system to a screeching halt. And if you look at independent lab tests, in this case from companies like NSS Labs, you find out that even the latest new versions of the firewalls and IPS devices, their performance can decrease up to 80%. So basically the, the, the effectiveness of that device has dropped 80% and you're getting 20% of your value of the device. That's certainly not a good thing. If you've already 100,000 or 100 million in your security infrastructure, you want to maximize that investment. So the perspective that needs to be uh, pursued is how can I maximize the investment without harming or disrupting my network infrastructure, my security infrastructure, while still being able to see these now hidden threats and the SSL traffic running across my organization. So. Um, Interesting statistics for those of you that are concerned about or uh, consider turning on SSL simply as a feature within your firewall or your IPS device. And another point to consider when you're addressing this, uh, this dilemma is that you have to consider not only the value and the comprehensiveness of your security, your, your defense in depth across your organization, you have to balance that with data privacy. And as you're well aware of, you know, Google and Yahoo, various companies are very strong advocates of 
data privacy, making sure that the, the, the Internet is open and neutral and so forth. And you certainly want to provide that uh, privacy across the organization, but at the same time, if it's a malicious or suspicious type of traffic, your IT department or you basically have to uh, inspect and understand and have the capability to look at that information if it is going to cause harm to the organization. So there's this constant battle and balance to address the risk of your organization between really a strong security posture and allowing confidentiality and data privacy of the traffic running across your network, in this case using SSL. So obviously addressing compliance and policy is very important to, uh, to meet this uh, balance, if you will. Uh, our approach at Blue Coat is to address all these issues appropriately. So in this case, uh, rather than saying it's just SSL inspection or decryption, let's raise that up. It's actually more than that. We're calling it encrypted traffic management. And by that, we're referring to several key functions that we want to pursue and we want to provide as a benefit. First and foremost, it's that visibility into all encrypted traffic, which is a major blind spot, as we just talked about. It's not just looking at port 444 or just HTTPS web traffic. It's looking at all SSL communications going across your organization and being able to take action upon that. So being able to actually block it, feed it to another device, um, prevent it from going uh, elsewhere, logging it, and so forth. And then besides the visibility point, it's combating the threats that can hide within SSL. So first is more of just really visibility and traffic management within your organization. That's the key point. Because you need to have both inbound and outbound information. The second one addresses more of the malware and the APT perspective. Because once again, more and more of these threats are using SSL, and you need to be able to combat them. Last but not least is the point I just made a moment ago, preserving privacy and policy and regulatory compliance. Some traffic, as you're well aware of, can't be touched. And as I talk to many customers and many partners, you find out that uh, some type of traffic like healthcare or financial services or government-related um, uh, network traffic, but you're not allowed to inspect it. Um, you know, various, various compliance uh, regulations out there, HIPAA, PCI, and so forth, will have a play in concern regarding inspecting uh, traffic from users and from employees and so forth. So you need to have that balance, and you need to be able to do that selectively. And last but not least, you look what's on the bottom of the slide here. It's really maximizing your security inf infrastructure investment. If you've already spent hundreds of thousands or millions on your security infrastructure, the best play moving forward to address encrypted traffic would not be to replace and forklift all of that investment. It would be just organization. Our approach is that you take advantage of and you build upon and optimize your security infrastructure to maintain it and preserve it even more so. So something that is not disruptive, but really complementary and interoperable with your existing infrastructure. And that's our approach at Blue Code. So it's about what that means from a product standpoint or from a solution standpoint. It's really these two offerings. And I think if you're a Blue Coat uh, customer or you're familiar with Blue Coat Solutions, uh, I think what you see here on the left, the Proxy SG gateway, should be quite familiar to you. Uh, that's had SSL visibility in it for quite some time. It's a full proxy, uh, has complete web control, so it focuses more on the HTTPS type of traffic, and it provides policy-based decryption. So we can selectively decrypt the information uh, to maintain privacy and security within an organization. By the way, we, we call that BCWF, as where most organizations use acronyms. That stands for Blue Coat Web Filter. So that ties into our back-end intelligent database, which we call the Global Intelligence Network. That allows you to create selective policies, excuse me, policy to selectively decrypt and inspect traffic uh, across your organization. And if you have an antivirus or DLP solution, uh, we can feed that newly decrypted information to it via the ICAP standard. So you can take advantage of then looking at the attached content that was formerly de uh, encrypted that is now decrypted, and you can do further processing and analysis. And then last but not least, for the Proxy SG, you can feed an attached monitoring or analysis device, say security analytics, or a IDS or SNORT type of device, through a uh, option we call encrypted tap. So you could send that information, uh, decrypted information, a copy port out to those devices for further processing. So 
it's just important because a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, customers out there that have the proxy SG, and you could certainly turn it up a notch and provide that SSL visibility through that product very much so today. Another product we have here is on the right hand side of the screen. That's the SSL visibility appliance, and that's really kind of the cornerstone of our traffic management solution set. And this is what we'll talk about here in a moment with a demo that David Wells will take over. But this is a very powerful, dedicated platform that focuses on SSL visibility and quality control for all SSL traffic. It looks at all ports, all traffic. It doesn't matter if it's running Speedy or if it's running uh, IMAP uh, S or if it's running POP 3 S. It doesn't matter. Even if it's doing some obscure and different type of port, we can see it, which is important, once again, for that first point of visibility. What's going in your network? What's going out of your network that's encrypted? Secondly, we can uh, use policies to selectively decrypt that information. And we can basically say, once again, do not in, um, encrypt, excuse me, do not inspect or decrypt healthcare traffic or financial services type of traffic. But if there's some type of malicious or unknown traffic running on your network, or it's running from a known uh, site like a malnet site or a malware site, you can automatically set policies to decrypt and inspect that information appropriately. So we call that <clears throat> back-end capability the host categorization feature. Once again, it's leak, uh, linking into our global intelligence network, which is our worldwide database that has uh, real-time, up-to-date malware and threat analysis information. Dedicated performance, high-performance device uh, supports up to 4 gigabits of SSL throughput. And and for those of you that are familiar with this, you know that's uh, extremely high. Most organizations never hit that uh, amount. They're significantly less. So we have a lot of uh, power and uh, capability to support the most demanding environments. And then a key feature here, and, and David will talk about this briefly, is support connectivity and feed multiple devices simultaneously. So this goes into the point of preserving your existing security infrastructure. If you already have your firewalls, or your IPS device, and you realize that they're burdened and they're tremendously, uh, their performance is reduced by turning on SSL, we can feed them with the decrypted traffic and take that burden from them. And likewise, we can feed DLP, security analytics, uh, anti-malware or sandboxing solutions. We can do the same thing. We can do that simultaneously. The great benefit of this product is that we can feed multiple devices simultaneously with decrypted traffic so they can process it and manage it appropriately and take it from there. Uh, we call that feature decrypt once, feed many, which is quite unique because most solutions only have one port they could send to or one device and it tends to be passive. We could send it to multiple devices on a segment and uh, those devices can be active or passive. So tremendous benefit for your infrastructure and for you as you build out your security infrastructure where we let you keep what you have and we really optimize it and give it new visibility and control of formally encrypted traffic. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, David Wells. And David, I know you have a, a, a demo that we can share with our, uh, our users today. David, are you with us? And you may be on um, double mute only because I had to turn myself on and off of mute. Uh, in order to actually clear that. So I could do it twice. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. OK. Um, and I, I'm, so I seem to have lost the presentation. Are we still displaying the presentation only? Yeah, Trevor, can you bring that up? It just disappeared. Yeah, we've still got some slides to go through before we do the demo, so we need I've the... I've uh, David a uh, presentation, right, so you can do the demo, David. Uh, right, but I'm not ready for the demo yet. We still have some slides to go through on the slide deck, so can we just have the slides back for now? Yeah, not a problem. Okay, great. So what I want to do just quickly before we um, move on and look at the, the live demo is just 
pick up from what Greg said and talk a little bit about the appliances that we're going to be demonstrating here and run you through kind of an overview of the demo before we, we, we get to that. So the SSL Visibility Appliance uh, products from Blue Coat, there's a family of products and I'm not going to talk to all the detail on this slide, um, but it'll be in the, uh, the slide deck when you, you get that after the webinar and you can see all of the, the detail and take it in then. The, the primary thing to to point out here though is that there's a wide range of performance from being able to handle down as low as 250 megabits of SSL traffic being decrypted and re-encrypted all the way up to 4 gigabits of, of traffic um, being de decrypted and re-encrypted in the high-end model. Um, the other detail just to, to get from this slide is that in the low-end models we support 10, 100, 1000 copper and fiber interfaces but on the, the higher mid-range and the high end, you can add in, you can choose the, the options for interfaces, but those options also include 10 gig fiber interfaces. So these are solutions that you can deploy in your, your enterprise network, no matter what current topology you're using. They can go uh, in line in, in the gigabit copper network, or you can put them in line in 10 gig networks and fiber, and feed security tools. As Greg said, one of the benefits of these appliances is they will feed your IPS or your IDS or your security analytics um, and they can feed multiple devices at the same time and they can do that over gigabit or 10 gigabit uh, interfaces as well. So I'm going to skip past this slide for now. I mean if you've got more questions on this we can always take some in Q&A at the end. But the important thing before we do the, the demonstration is just to uh, talk about how the visibility appliance is, is put together, what the deployment model looks like. Now, the important point to grasp here is that the deployment model is per segment. What we configure when we configure the box is a segment, and a segment is a set of physical interfaces on the box that are configured together and associated with a set of policy rules that determine what happens to traffic and that connects to one or more security appliances that are going to see that traffic. So if you've got a box with enough interfaces, you can quite happily configure multiple segments, each of them independent of each other, that are monitoring uh, SSL traffic at different points in your network and potentially feeding uh, different security tools in different places. So there are three deployment models. Now I'll just mention them briefly before we get to the demo. The first of these is what's called passive tap. So in this model, the visibility appliance is attached to a network tap, and it's receiving a copy of the network traffic, just like any other device that would attach to a network tap. In passive tap mode, we can inspect traffic, but only in a constrained set of circumstances that's defined by the way the SSL protocol works. So the, it's the same is true for any solution. In passive tap mode, when you're processing a copy of the SSL traffic, the only traffic you can gain visibility into is inbound SSL traffic going to servers that you control and where you can have the server's certificate and private key loaded into the visibility appliance and where the key exchange mechanism in SSL is using RSA. If it's using key exchange mechanisms like Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, you won't be able to inspect at all when it's on a, a passive tap configuration. And increasingly, sites like Google will by default use elliptic curve to the to key exchange. So for any other deployment, you have to have the visibility appliance as a, a, a physical inline device. It's a bump in the wire with the traffic flowing through it. And we have what we call passive inline segments where we're a bump in the wire, the, the SSL traffic flows through, um, as does all the other non-SSL traffic but we can feed multiple passive devices that are just going to consume the traffic we feed them, including the decrypted SSL. And it's important to point out here that we don't just feed the decrypted traffic to the security tools that are attached, we feed all the traffic. So if you have a security tool that attached to a, a network tap in your network today, effectively the visibility appliance would replace that network tap. The tool would still see all of the network traffic, including the non-SSL traffic, the difference is it would see the SSL traffic decrypted if that was what your policy was configured to do. 
And then the final uh, deployment model is what we call active inline. So in this case, again, the visibility appliances are bumping the wire, but now it's got an active security appliance attached. So that will be something like an IPS. And by active, we mean that the visibility appliance is going to feed traffic to that security tool, and the security tool is going to feed that traffic back to the visibility appliance before it goes on its way. So in this case, the IPS, if this was an IPS device, would see all of the non-SSL traffic, process it just like it does if the visibility appliance isn't present. But for SSL traffic, it would actually receive a decrypted version of that traffic. Therefore, it could detect any threats that were there, drop any packets that contained bad things. And if it did that, we would clear the session, um, the SSL session, to make sure that malware didn't propagate to the, the end system. So that's the, the, the deployment model options that exist for the, the product. Um, and what I now want to do, because we, we, we want to get through the demo so we've got some time for Q&A, is really just give you a quick picture of what the demo setup is before we go and look at it live. So we've got a very simple demo here. We've got a client machine connecting to an active inline segment. So in this case, the two bump in the wire ports are the port 1 and port 4. The IPS I've replaced, in this case, just with a piece of wire. Um, and effectively, on the red links, SSL traffic will always be encrypted. On the link between these two ports where the IPS would be, the SSL traffic may be decrypted depending on how policy is set. And this client machine is talking out to the internet to, to access uh, services that are running SSL. So what we're going to do in the demo is effectively show you a policy rule that is letting you decide whether or not traffic should be inspected. And this policy rule is going to use the host categorization capability that Greg mentioned. So we'll be able to choose, based on the category of the destination, whether or not we provide visibility into this traffic for the attached security tools. So the rule that you can see here is, is what you'll see on the demo screen in a minute. But in this rule, um, I've got a host category list configured called private. And essentially, the action this rule will take is to cut through, I leave the traffic alone, if the category of the destination falls into the list of categories I've called private. And you'll see how this is set up in the demo. But one thing to just point out on this rule is there's many other things I could configure in the rule as well. I could configure the, the source IP subnetwork or the destination IP and, and other issues. So you can build very fine-grained policy if you want to. And you can combine policies that use basic information from the, the packet headers or information from the SSL server certificate along with the host categorization capability that comes down from the, the global information network. So what we're going to see is host categories. So this is the, the complete set of host categories. And you can see here I've got checkboxes on financial services and government legal and on health. But you can create a list with as many categories in it as you like. And then you can have rules that will match on that list. And you can have many lists of categories. So you can have different rules for different combinations. Um, and one thing to say, just in terms of the, the Blue Code products, is this same set of categories that are used by the SSL visibility appliance is the set of categories that the Proxy SG product uses with its Blue Code web filter. So there's consistency between the products. And I'm just waiting for the next slide to advance. OK, so what we're going to see in the demo, just before I pull up uh, a browser screen and show you this for real, is we'll show you the session log on the visibility appliance that lets you see what SSL traffic it's seeing and whether or not it's being inspected. We'll see that there's a policy rule. And, and we'll go to a banking site, and you'll see that it is, is actually being made visible. We'll then look at the policy rule that's using a host cat list. And initially, that list doesn't have any categories in it, which is why we'll see the traffic being inspected. We'll add, we'll add financial category to that list, and then go back to the bank and show you that uh, the session gets cut through rather than inspected. So if I just 
minimize those screens and share my screen. Um, can you make me present it? Oh, thank you. Okay, can you see my screen now? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, David, it looks good. We can see it, David. Yeah, okay, yes. good. All right, thanks. So what I'm showing at the moment is the, the management UI on the SSL Visibility Appliance. Um, the product I'm working on, you can see, has got four interfaces that are allocated to segment A. That's the active inline segment, just like we saw on the, the preceding slide. And if I go to the session log, this shows us an entry for each um, SSL session that's gone through here. So this is just historic traffic we're looking at at the moment, but you can see it's been decrypted. It's saying the action was decrypted and it was successful. So what I will do is just pull up a client machine here that's running um, a browser. Let's close the browser and open it again. Um, and in this browser, I can go to um, a banking website. So in this case, it's going to my actual bank in the UK. But given there's an SSL visibility appliance in the loop, I'm not going to log on. Um, but if we now just flip back to the session log and update it, you can now see that there's entries that are going to bank.barclays.co.uk. They were decrypted successfully. So at the moment, I'm providing visibility into that traffic for any of the attached security tools to see what's going on between me and my bank. Now, we don't really want that in a lot of environments. So what I'm going to do here is look at the rule set. So this is the rule set that I have configured for this segment. I've got one rule that says cut through for sites that we know we can't inspect. That's a relatively small set of sites that if you try and do SSL inspection on them, it will break them. So we, we cut those through automatically. I've then got a, a rule here that says the action is to cut through, and it's for a category list called private. And if I look at that rule, you can see there's the name of the category list that we're going to use. And then I've got a final rule, which is the one that will apply to everything else, which says decrypt. Now, if we look at the category list called private, we can see that currently it doesn't have any entries. So that's why when I went to the banking site, the traffic was inspected because it didn't match, the category that was looked up didn't match this list, and therefore it fell through in the catch-all rule at the bottom to inspect kick in. So what we're going to do here is just add this category list, financial services, and health, for example, and say OK. And now you can see there in the list, and I can apply that. So the next time that that policy rule that is using this list is invoked, it will, if it finds the, the, the response it gets for the destination is that it's in the category financial services, the rule will be triggered. So if we go back to the session log here, um, and over here, I'll just start the browser again. And we'll go back to the banking site. And then we'll look at the session log again. And now you can see all these sessions to bank.barclays.co.uk were cut through, which was the action that the rule triggered on and was successful. So that category list has now worked. And if I look at the detail for this session, you can see that it shows that the it matched on rule two and it matched on the category financial services. So you can see that we've, we've very easily configured um, uh, a rule to do category-based 
first category ma matching to apply policy. And you can have as many rules with as great a flexibility as you want in the system if you're doing this. Um, and the other thing that I'll just highlight on here um, by going back to the browser for a second, and I just want to fire up uh, a session to Gmail. And then we'll go back to the session log over here. So now you can see mail.google.com. And we're decrypting this because obviously webmail doesn't fall into the financial services category. Um, but the other thing just to notice here is that the Cypher suite in use is using elliptic curve Diffie Hellman for key exchange. That's the default on Google these days, as long as the browser supports it. And it's also using a, a bulk Cypher suite called Char 20 Poly 1305, which is a Google-specific Cypher suite that they are in the process of trying to get standardized in uh, the ITF. But we actually support it, and we can inspect that traffic uh, with the SSL Visibility Appliance today. So with that, I think, given where we are time-wise, we should maybe uh, move on to, to Q&A. So I'll, I'll hand back to, uh, to John, and uh, we can uh, take any questions. Thanks, David. We did get a number of questions. If anybody has some last minute ones, uh, trying to enter them in. We'll see if we can get to them. Uh, let's see. I'll take the first question here. Is uh, How strong is SSL considered these days, given the growth in computing power and cloud-type uh, computing capabilities? Well, um, you know, the, the CA browser form uh, last year, early last year, told everybody to move to longer 2048-bit 20, SSL certificates, to use longer keys, to sort of up the strength of SSL. I think more importantly, the, the strength of the transport encryption is probably appropriate and strong enough, even given the strength uh, increase in computing power. Most of the successful attacks, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, have been taking advantages of vulnerabilities in the software implementing SSL or in compromising endpoints to be able to do man-in-the-middle type attacks. So bottom line, for its intended purpose, protecting bits in motion and the like, um, SSL is still plenty strong today, making sure you're managing your keys and protecting your endpoints and uh, doing SSL right is probably more important these days than, than just the brute strength. Uh, let's see, we did have a question here. Uh, let me pick, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in right now after the uh, demo, so let me jump to one of those. Um, when you did that demo and you showed Google Mail, what certificate did your client browser receive? I think the basic question a couple of these are at is, in, in order to do that two-way description of a, a, a desktop session to Google Mail, how do you provision certificates? How does all that work? OK, so uh, it's dead wells here. I'll, I'll kind of address that. Um, just before I do, though, one, one comment I was going to make, John, to the previous question. Um, I agree with you. I mean, I think the, the, the ciphers that are used for the, the, the data in motion are, are strong enough for most things. But one thing that we have seen over the last 18 months or so is a lot of the big SSL um, operators, so people like Google and Yahoo and Facebook are, and, and Twitter, have all moved from using RSA for key exchange to either using Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. And the, re the reason they've done that is that it is possible with the RSA key exchange that you can run a replay attack, you can capture traffic, and then if you can compromise the, the server later on and get the key, you can replay that traffic and see what it included, whereas you can't do that with uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or, or DHE. So, so definitely that's a trend that we've seen in the key exchange mechanism towards mechanisms that, that support what's called a perfect form of secrecy. Um, but so to the question around how do you provision uh, certificates so you can inspect the, the traffic going to, to Gmail, for example, the technique that's used is what's called certificate resign. So effectively, if you think of the SSL handshake, the client initiates the session to the server. The server responds during the SSL handshake with the server certificate. And in order to intercept the session and be able to inspect it, what the visibility appliance does and other products that are doing SSL visibility is it will intercept that server certificate, remove it from the wire, modify it, and then send the modified server certificate on its way to the client. 
Now, that modification of the service certificate is really to replace the original server's public keys, which the server has the corresponding private key for, with public keys that the SSL visibility appliance has got the private key for. And what is done there is the, the certificate is modified, and it is then signed by a certificate authority that is in the SSL visibility appliance. And that re-signed server certificate is sent to the, the client. If the client doesn't trust the certificate authority that's being used by the SSL visibility appliance, then the browser will generate a warning saying you shouldn't trust this site. So in the enterprise environment, the CA that you're using in the SSL visibility appliance would typically be uh, an enterprise intermediate CA that's already trusted by all the desktops and clients in your enterprise. So they would trust that modified server certificate. It still says it's a server certificate for uh, mail.google.com and all the other attributes that uh, it contained originally are still there in the case of the modified server cert that we send from the visibility plans to the client. Um, the difference is that we've, we've modified the keys and certs and we've signed it with a certificate authority that's in the box. And that CA needs to be trusted by the client. Does that answer the question? I think I got it. Um, we also had a number of questions, all basically around in your demo, you showed you were going out to Barclays, you, you turned on a rule that included financial services, and the, the uh, appliance recognized that Barclays was financial services. How does that matching occur? Does Blue Code have some big list, uh, all those categories where right. it fills in URLs? Well, right, so there's, there's two parts to the answer. The first part is the the host category list that we're comparing against is maintained by the Global Information Network, which is part of Blue Cross Cloud Service. So effectively, within the visibility appliance, I, there's a local database that is the complete categorization database. And that's what we test against when we see any new flow that we're looking up on. But we get continuous updates of that category database from the Blue Cross Cloud Service. So most categorization is a subscription service, and it pulls down updates continually from the cloud. So the maintenance of that database, the, the category, you know, whenever a new site comes up on the internet, the global information network sees that very quickly, and then classifies it and updates the database. And the updated database then gets down to the the box within uh, you know 10 minutes or so. So. There is a centralized, continuously real-time updated database, and that's what the the lookups are really being you know, done against. Now, in terms of what you're looking up, I mean, somebody said it's just a big list of URLs. Um, that's not quite true. Um, yes, it's a big list of URLs, and if you're dealing with non-encrypted traffic, so if it's just HTTP traffic, you can just look at the URL in the in the session and match it against the URL in the database. The issue with encrypted traffic is that you can't do that because you don't necessarily see the URL. The URLs only occur as part of the HTTP, and as Greg said earlier, you may not be count SSL may be carrying protocols other than the HTTP, but you can't see the URL in the HTTP until you've decrypted the flow. So it's difficult to use that as a decision point as a for, for whether or not you should inspect. What you have to do with SSL is use the information that's available at the point you see the, the server certificate, because that's when you need to make the decision on interception or not. And the information you've got is essentially all the data that's in the server certificate, all of the standard IP packet header information, and also something called the, the service name identifier, the SNI, that a browser will typically put into the client hello message in the SSL handshake. And with a combination of all three bits of that information, you can effectively arrive at what the URL, the HTTPS, colon, slash, whatever, will be for the destination that this is going to, and that's what you look up in the database. Okay. So we can sneak in one more question answer, here. but yes, I mean, it, it's a real-time database. Sure. Then we sneak in one more question. What type of latency will I see in the active inline method versus the passive uh, inspection method? Um, in active inline mode on the visibility appliance, if it's non-SSL traffic, i.e. traffic we're not going to decrypt and recrypt, that we we add something like 40 miles.
microseconds of latency as it passes through it. So it, it, it's non-existent as far as the user is concerned. For an SSL session that we are decrypting and re-encrypting, the latency is very low as well. We, we don't have a measured number on it, and that's because measuring it is quite complex, and we, we probably don't have enough time to go into the detail on that. But essentially, the, the issue when you're trying to figure out the latency is that the decrypt and re-encrypt works at the SSL layer where it's working on SSL records. And you have to have a complete record before you can decrypt it. Um, but the records aren't aligned with TCP packet boundaries. So you may have to receive three packets before you get a complete record, and then you can decrypt it and do your stuff and then re-encrypt it and send it on its way. Um, so if you measure the latency for the first packet, it will be large because you can't send out the, the packet with the re-encrypted data on the other side until you've received the two that come after it and done the decrypt and recrypt. But, I mean, you know, we're still talking, you know, fractions of a millisecond. I mean, it, it's not noticeable to users. Nobody notices the degradation in the the application that's running uh, when we're in line doing decrypt and recrypt. Okay, with that, we're just about out of time. Uh, we'll uh, bring up um, a list of URLs where you can get more information, both uh, where the archive presentations will be, on the critical controls, um, some upcoming SANS events. There's Blue Coats URLs. If your question did not get answered, if you're watching the recorded version of this and you have a question, you can send it to q at sans.org. And we'll get you a question later. Uh, we'll get you an answer later. And then there's my Twitter handle if for some reason you feel an urge to tweet, tweet at me. Any questions? There you go. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Trevor for the closing words. Thank you, John. I'd like to say thank you so much to our featured speakers, John, Greg, and David, for the great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in today. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.